It's my distinct pleasure and privilege to be asked to bring a few words. And the topic really is to remind Trinidad and Tobago about two things. One, this administration's stance and fight against corruption and the fact that we will not tolerate corruption in any form or fashion, once we're aware of it, we will do all that we can in our power and within our authority to fight it on behalf of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. And secondly, to remind you how we ended up at this point, and in particular, what took place under former administration and the award of billions of dollars in cash via contract to a company that is now internationally covered completely in what has become known globally as the biggest corruption scandal in the world taking place today and with respect to a company in Brazil called OAS. Anybody who has been following the news from 2014 to now will know that the OAS corporations in Brazil have brought down Two presidents, two former presidents, one of them has now been incarcerated and is jailed, carrying out a 12-year sentence, at least four senators, a number of executives, and it is absolutely shocking what has taken place with this company that was hand-picked by a former administration. And they don't like us to remind you, the public, as to what took place in the past, but on this day and this occasion, it is essential that we use the opportunity to remind you what we did in order to fight that corruption, including, as I was just reminding the Honorable Prime Minister, we have sent to the Commissioner of Police photographs of executives of the former administration in private planes flying all over the world with the now jailed executives of OAS on their way to the World Cup in South Africa where the then Minister of Works and Transport was at the time located globally. With that preamble, allow me. The process for the construction of this highway was, was initiated by the previous PNM government through a competitive invitation of tenders in early 2010. This is something that the opposition likes to throw at us, saying this started under the PNM. I am about to tell you the God-given truth and not what those on the other side, and in particular, the member of parliament for Tabakit, likes to tell the population. Although tenders were received in April 2010, the contract was not awarded by a PNM administration prior to the May 24th general elections, since the bids received were significantly higher than the engineer's then estimate of 3.6 billion TT dollars. The PNM government and administration did not award any contract for the construction of this highway because just before leaving office, it was of the opinion it was significantly more than the engineer's estimate. However, on the 4th of March 2011, the former government, through NIDCO, awarded a design-build contract to Brazilian firm Constitura OAS SA, OAS, for the lump sum of approximately 5.2 billion TT dollars or 1.6 billion TT dollars more than the engineer's estimate. So from inception, they awarded the contractor OAS, a firm that was yet unknown and tested in Trinidad and Tobago for over 1.6 billion dollars more than the engineer's estimate. The major benefit of using FIDIC Terms and conditions, this was a FIDIC yellow book, is that the terms and conditions are standard and internationally recognized. A party should only, with very good reason, amend the standard terms and conditions of FIDIC type contracts. Despite this, the former government changed the standard and accepted advance payment term from 10% to 20%. So from inception, Rather than advance payment of 10%, the former administration saw it fit to grant 20%. This upward amendment resulted in OAS receiving approximately $856 million as opposed to TT $428 million 
as an advance. So from inception, they almost double the amount of money that is internationally acceptable for these types of contracts in payments to OAS. Another major issue at inception was that all payments made to OAS for activities under the letter of intent, which totaled $236.4 million, should have been deducted from the advance payment. However, it was not deducted. This is at the inception of the contract and the award by the former administration. So even before construction began, the former government provided OAS with over $1 billion of our taxpayers' money at that point in time. The project, as you heard Minister Sinanon say, should have been completed in March 2015. It was a four-year contract to provide a four-lane divided highway with full-grade super-separated interchanges. It included eight such interchanges, as well as eight river bridges. When the UN UNC administration left office, the project was far from complete. Rather than utilize low interest rate funding for this billion dollar infrastructural project, remember it started off at 5.6 billion from a multilateral lending agency, for example, the IDB, the UNC government paid OAS and others via cash transfers from the Ministry of Finance up to 2014, putting a strain on the country's available cash. I would like to suggest to you, citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, one of the reasons for going that route is you avoid the mechanisms to safeguard public money when you pay in cash. If we had gone via IDB financing, before every tranche of money is paid to OAS and the contractors, an international organization would have independent people verify work done, value for money, and amount to be paid. The former administration avoided all of this by using your taxpayers' cash from the Treasury for this massive infrastructural project. When the UNC left office in September 2015, over $5 billion in cash was spent with only 49% of the construction being completed by OAS. They contracted for $5.6 billion, supposed to be completed by March 2015. In September 2015, they had paid out over $5 billion in cash, and that does not include the astronomical land acquisition costs, which I will talk about on another occasion. Despite the UNC government telling the population over and over it was on budget and on time, this quite simply was not true. In fact, the contract was in trouble from the start. OAS began to run into serious difficulties by early 2015. They defaulted on paying subcontractors. They were late in paying workers. Their difficulties continued with worsening effect, and subsequently they demobilized in December 2015, with the site being almost completely abandoned. They never returned to work, and were protests. there were protests by workers for non-payment of salaries, lawsuits by third parties, repossession of equipment taking place by the time this administration took over. Against this backdrop, OAS filed for judicial reorganization in Brazil on the 31st of March 2015, whereby it sought bankruptcy protection. The authorities in Brazil commenced investigations and prosecutions in March 2014. One year later, OAS filed for bankruptcy in Brazil in March 2015. In law and under contract, OAS was considered to be bankrupt from the 31st of March 2015. And now, currently as we stand and sit here today, OAS is in supervised reorganization in Brazil under the authorities with international bodies such as the FBI in the United States, prosecutorial bodies in Brazil, bodies all over the world who are law enforcement investigating corrupt payments to not only Brazilian officials, but other international officials. By March 2015, therefore, the project was in dire difficulties. The former government should have been pursuing ways and means to terminate the contract with OAS to protect our interests, the public's interest. Under FIDIC, the type of contract, 
There are various ways to terminate with varying degrees of complication and potential litigation. However, virtually all commercial contracts allow for automatic termination upon a party declaring bankruptcy. So in other words, once OAS declared bankruptcy, automatically under the contract, the government of Trinidad and Tobago could have terminated the contract with a company that was already being investigated for bribery, corruption, international scandal, already way over budget behind time. The UNC government could have and should have immediately invoked clause 15.2e and terminated OAS on the ground that it was bankrupt. This is probably the simplest and least contentious form of termination under FIDIC, and OAS would not have been able to defend this in any manner whatsoever. However, it gets worse. On September 4th, 2015, September 4th, 2015, the last working day before a general election on the 7th of September, 2015, the UNC government, rather than use an opportunity to terminate this contract in a clean, cost-effective, non-contentious manner, secretly, surreptitiously, and I add corruptly, entered into a written agreement with OAS, whereby that government waived the ability to terminate the contract on the grounds of OAS's bankruptcy. Instead, on the 4th of September 2015, the UNC government reaffirmed in writing their desire to keep a company that was bankrupt in Brazil and the subject of the largest corruption scandal in the world within recent times as their preferred contractor for the Point Fourteen Highway. This was done against the advice of NITCO's independent advisors and consultants. On September 4th, 2015, the former government entered into a written agre agreement with OAS called Contract Addendum Number 2, whereby they expressly recognized that OAS was bankrupt, stated expressly that they could invoke Clause 15.2e of the FIDIC contract, immediately terminating terminating the contract. So in that contract entered onto on the last working day before a general election, they recognize OAS is bankrupt. They recognize they can terminate OAS. They recognize they can get out of the contract without litigation and contention. However, despite this, they proceeded secretly to give up the right of termination and waived all claims against OAS thus releasing and discharging OAS from any liability to Trinidad and Tobago. Citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, we have never, never been given an explanation for this atrocious and corrupt behavior by the former government on the last working day before a general election. This action by the UNC government the day before a general election was ludicrous. They have never accounted to us, the population and never explain why they threw away the cleanest, easiest, most cost-effective, and simplest opportunity to have terminated OES. Additionally, they removed from OES responsibility of substantial sections of the highway. So they took out at that stage substantial sections of the highway to be completed and allowed them a further year to complete a more limited amount of the highway and at an additional cost to us, the taxpayers. They removed 26% of the original work OAS was supposed to do, worth over $1.5 billion. But surprisingly, they still agreed to pay OAS over $5 billion for this reduced scope of works. They also agreed to a new completion date of May 28, 2016, one year after the original completion date. So to summarize, on the 4th of September 2015, when OAS was in bankruptcy, experiencing severe difficulty in meeting its obligations to local suppliers, subcontractors, its workers, and involved in the largest corruption investigation and scandal in the world, rather than terminate them, the former government allowed, agreed to allow OAS to continue with the contract for roughly 
the same sum they originally contracted for, that is over $5 billion, and to do less than 75% of the work they were contracted to do. And they went further to burden us. Ladies and gentlemen, that is what this administration faced as we came in. As your Minister of Works told you, there were workers protesting, the union led marches to his office, etc. What did we, your government, do? We did two things in parallel. The Ministry of Works through NITCO has done all of the great things they've told you about this morning. Immediately set about separating it into sub-packages, sub-contracts to give to our local workforce and contractors. And we at the Office of the Attorney General immediately set about to protect your rights and to ensure that we recovered as much as we can from this corrupt and bankrupt OAS. We immediately hired some of the best lawyers available. We sat down very quietly and meticulous, meticulously with all of the documentation and began to prepare two cases for Trinidad and Tobago. One, to recover standby letters of credits and bonds, and two, to defend the action that OAS had the goal and audacity to bring against us when we terminated their contract with effect from the 5th of July 2016. When we terminated the contract on the 5th of July 2016, NIDCO was entitled to call in payments of various standby letters of credit in accordance with contractual obligations from various international banks, namely Citibank North America, Banco Santander, Credit Agricole, and PNB Paribas SA to secure just about $1 billion TT in payments. Pursuant to NIDCO's call for payment, that was handled by our team of lawyers with supervision from the Office of the Attorney General. Citibank promptly paid to NIDCO the aggregate sum of TT approximately $283 million, being the entire amount due to NIDCO from Citibank. However, Banco Santander SC, Credit Agricole, and BNP Paribas SC refused to effect payment to NIDCO under the various standby letters of credit issued by them all of which were expressly stated to be governed by and construed in the courts of England and according to English law. In order to obtain payments of monies due and owing from PNB Paribas SA and Credit Agricole on the 16th of August 2016, NIDCO commenced legal proceedings in the Commercial High Court of London, England against these banks. We fought them in the English High Courts, in the Commercial Courts, and we fought them hard. Credit Agricole ultimately cap capitulated and paid to NIDCO the sum of 12 million TT on the 19th of September 2016. However, PNB Paribas SC contested NIDCO's claim for payment, for payment to no avail. We won in the commercial courts of England. They then forced us to go to the commercial court of appeal in England, London. We fought them there, we won. And we then went to what was the House of Lords, now the Supreme Court of England, and we finally succeeded there sometime in late 2016. They expected us to capitulate. I have heard it said by the opposition, it is the agreements that they put in place that help us to succeed. Again, that is completely untrue. Not one of them came forward to give evidence. We built out the cases quietly in Nidco's office, and we fought them hard in the courts, all the way up to the highest court of the land in England. And we succeeded, and we recovered for the people of Trinidad and Tobago, just short of one billion TT dollars as a result of that work. And it is that billion TT dollars that has been utilized by this government through the Ministry of Works and Transport and NIDCO to do the work that you're seeing being done to complete this highway. Even though OAS is subject to the largest corruption scandal and investigation in the world, their lawyers took us to arbitration. And they did something, I think, to intimidate the government of Trinidad and Tobago. Their contract was with NIDCO. So they're entitled to sue and to arbitrate against NIDCO. They joined the government of Trinidad and Tobago and sued the Attorney General. We fought that. We fought it before three international arbitrators who ruled against us and decided to keep the state through the Attorney General in those arbitration proceedings. Again, quietly, without fanfare, 
meticulously, team of lawyers huddled and together we designed the strategy as to how to defeat that. The implication of that would mean that any contractor who had a contract with NIDCO, NIPDEC, any state enterprise, when they sued them, could try and bring the central government into it. And in my, my personal opinion, and the Office of the Attorney General, that would have been a disastrous precedent to set for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And after a year of sitting with the attorneys, arguing with the attorneys, sometimes screaming at them to listen to us, the attorneys at law, again, quietly, without fanfare, went to the high courts of Trinidad and Tobago. And last week, we succeeded. The high courts of Trinidad and Tobago have ruled that the central government is to play no part in those arbitration proceedings. So once again, this government has quietly, effectively, and efficiently protected the taxpayers of Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> On behalf of the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago and the cabinet that he leads, we give you the assurance that whilst we are the government of Trinidad and Tobago, our decisions will continue to be a fight against corruption and to always do what is right for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. We cannot be intimidated. You can threaten us. We will not be intimidated. And we will continue to just live by the mantra of doing what is right for Trinidad and Tobago. We thank you for that opportunity and privilege.